Paul and I had talked about a few weeks ago was that we were going to show you pictures of our cattle and also how we're using our cattle. But I also wanted to present to you some information that we give to our students and show you examples of some exercises that we do in, in using these cattle. And so if, if y'all want to go through the exercise and answer the questions, that's fine, but we don't, we don't have to. Uh, so I will show you some different current pictures uh, from this past week. And, uh, and Colin said, we know you're going to talk, so please show a lot of photos so people don't fall asleep. <laughs> but I want to show you a lot of different pictures. He did ask me to spend some time talking about concepts uh, that we promote to our students about uh, just general thoughts on practical use of collecting performance data and how those get used by our breed associations that calculate EPDs and a little bit on DNA and genomics just as a lead-in to Dr. White and what she's going to talk about uh, later on. Okay, so if you have a question, you can't understand what I'm saying, or I'm going too fast or too slow, uh, please let me know. So, if w one of the things that we really want to showcase to our students is use of these different purebred herds as they have utility in the industry. Dr. Clear and Shed a minute ago. So, just a few uh, pictures here on uh, these were the the females probably about a year ago or so, so after they had gotten uh, exposed to breeding before they were calved in, the, in uh, this past spring. And so one of the things that we really like to have our students involved in is a lot of hands-on type of activities when possible as we teach our, our different labs. And so Tuesday morning I went out to get some current pictures and just walked out to the pasture where uh, the cows were, and there's some other non-beef masters <coughs> that are recipes that we've used for, for embryo calves. And I just had to wait for about 10 minutes because they all just were there hanging around me and, you know, I, I needed them to, to walk off. The temperament is excellent in all these cattle. And so we try to promote that and we try to teach <coughs> our students how to act around cattle, but having cattle that we can work with in a lot of different situations and not have to worry about endangering anybody, cattle or students is, is really important to us. And so we've used the, both the Red Angus and the Beef Master in different scenarios. This is one of the labs where they, we had uh, some of those yelling calves stalled individually and they had to use both visual evaluation with some others and they come and look at these and talk about their, their records and their, their EPDs. And so you know, sometimes that's a cold keep sort of a scenario. Sometimes that's deciding which two might be the best fit for an upcoming uh, female cell or things like that. And so the students really enjoy that. Sometimes they have to do some other things that is also beneficial. So when we wean calves on the 15th and 16th of September, Dr. Harrow, our veterinarian, said we need to also get blood samples and get fecal samples and check the parasites. Okay. And so we like to get the students involved in doing all different types of things so that they can see all, all different aspects. So that's really important. So this gives us a whole new level to do things in our teaching program from both the performance data, pedigree information, and the, the practical stuff that we can do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So now I'm going to slip into uh, teacher mode, professor mode a little bit and talk about some different things. I have used something similar to this in other presentations and in my uh, beef production class to get our students starting to think about uh, performance records and how to fairly compare different animals so that we can make the best genetic decisions. And so here's a little scenario. So let's say that we've got a cow calf operation and they're raising their own bulls and they have decided that they needed to reduce birth weight in their herd. Okay, so why that is that we're not worried about that. People do different things, okay? But that's that's their goal. Okay, and so they've got two calves produced this year in their herd. Okay, and so they were born two days apart. One weighed 80 pounds, one weighed 86 pounds, and here are their weaning weights, which are pretty close to each other. And so the I tell the students if they wanted to pick one of these bulls and try to reduce birth weight. Is this information alone useful for them to uh, 
start that route. And so does anybody want to offer any, any thoughts about that? Yes, sir? I'd like to see the Berkeley EPDs. Okay. That would be a, a start. Okay. So everybody, by the time we leave today, everybody knows how to spell EPD, right? <laughs> so EPD means what? Expected <coughs> progeny difference. Expect, expected progeny difference, right? The value of that animal is a potential parent. Okay? So we might want to look at the EPDs, not just the actual birth weights, right? Okay? Anybody else got any other thoughts about this? Other calves out of the same bull. It'd be interesting to know, you know what the body condition of the things were. Okay, so what the what did the cows look like that these calves came out of is one aspect. I heard somebody else over here say something else. I thought. What did you say, Ron? Okay, if they were, if they were out of different sire lines, that might be more information. Okay, that's something to think about. Yes, ma'am. If they were heifers or were cows. Okay, that's a really important concept, right? What if this was out of a first calf heifer and that was out of a six-year-old cow? We know that there's an age of dam effect on both weaning weight and birth weight, right? If we don't account for that, then that's noise in our data. Right? And there's a lot of other things to think about. In some situations, just when those calves are born during the calving season may impact their birth weight. Where our research center is near McGregor, we have calves born in the middle of the third week of February versus ones that are born in uh, the end of April. A lot of times we may see six to eight pound calves birth weight in those calves just as a function of the diets and the pasture conditions that the cows are eating, right? So that, anybody else have any other thoughts before I move on to, from this slide? The point is we have to have performance data and we have to have the other records that go along with that if we're going to make the best, best decisions. And in recent years, a lot of beef master sales and others have really started done, and really done a good job at promoting and using data sets for potential buyers to sort through animals and and tailor their own EPD profiles and things like that. So that's that's very positive. Okay, so y'all passed the test. Y'all passed the first test today. So what we're going to talk about a little bit more in depth is thinking about, you know, these are three main concepts that are associated with genetic improvement that have not changed and that will not change. Okay, now how we do things and the weight that we do things is likely to change, okay? But we need to we need to know the pedigree information, right? So if we don't have any idea about either parent, then we're we're limited. Can we still make genetic improvement using groups? Yes, but it's it's limited. And if we have one parent, that's better than uh, neither, right? But it's ideal to have both those. And why is that? Where do the genes come from in the parents? From the parents, right? And each parent. It's going to pass on half of its genetic value to a calf, right? So if we, the, all of our purebred breeders recognize that, okay? A lot of our commercial producers have not thought about that, but are now starting to think about that more and more, especially as some of our DNA technologies and uses develop, okay? Another one is that we've got to have an accurate measurement of the trait, and everybody knows that, right? So if you're using a set of scales, are the scales calibrated, what increment do they go in, right? We're weighing individual calves on a set of truck scales. That would affect the accuracy. And here's one I use in class sometimes. I say, okay, if you're working cow for somebody on a Saturday morning, and somebody's calling out your peg numbers and writing down calf weights, and they're severely hung over, does that affect the accuracy of the data? Right? So there's a lot of different things that go into that. That's noise in our data set if we don't watch out. That comes to another thing, right? And then the third thing is we've got to have an understanding of what uh, contemporary groups are. And so this is where we're just uh, recognizing that different management groups or different locations may potentially have some differences in performance. And so I think if I've got two pastures on uh, two sides of the paved road that goes through my place, and I treat the cows the same on both sides of the road, that they're all the same. But the soil conditions, the grass quality, things like that may be different, right? And 
And so if there really is a subtle difference between those two pastures, and I just say they're all part of the same management group, and there's a difference to this pasture that is reflected in those animals' EPDs the first time. Because it's saying the only difference in these animals over here is genetics, when in fact it was maybe due to the pasture, right? And so there, there's no problem with saying that there's different contemporary groups. If we lump them all together, that also adds noise to our data. And so, because what we really want to get at is, is identifying the genetic difference, right? So the only reason I have this slide up here is because I use this to represent that there's three different genetic types of cattle in this picture. Okay? So <coughs> these are all steers, I think, on oak pasture. Okay? But there's some calves out there that are uh, Angus back crosses. So they're three-fourths Angus and one-fourth Hereford. There's some that are Hereford back crosses. So they're three-fourths Hereford and one-fourth Angus. And there's some that are F1s, half Angus and half Hereford. Okay? So some of these animals you can look at and probably maybe get a guess on which one's what, right? So like that animal you think might be what? Probably a half-blood, okay? But could that be a three-quarter sure. Angus? Yeah. Absolutely, right? Or if we look at that one, right, that's probably one that's going to be three-fourths Hereford, right? Or this one's probably three-fourths Angus, but there's a lot of those that we don't know because the the same phenotype could be associated uh, with different uh, breed combinations and, and, and vice versa. Okay? So the, the reason we talk about contemporary groups is that it's usually the first foundation to try to identify what's due to genetic differences versus what's due to um, environmental differences. Okay? So I don't know for sure how if, uh, BDU classifies or describes the concept of a contemporary group. This is from the Beef Improvement Federation. And so usually animals that are in the same 90-day age range are automatically included in the same contemporary group. And I think that's what BDP does. Uh, if you have a calving season that's longer than 90 days, then that's going to be two different contemporary groups. And the reason that we do that is to adjust those records to where they're on an equal basis. So we have the actual wing rate of calf, the fact that some calves are two months older than the others, they're going to have a bigger wing weight on average. And we don't want to compare differences in calf ages, we want to compare differences in their actual genetics for growth. Same thing on the age of aspect. Okay? So thanks for being patient with me on that, because I know that's a review for a, a lot of you. Now let's talk about EPDs a little bit more. And so the main goal of EPDs is to try to an idea about an animal as a potential parent, right? Compared to another animal in that breed. Several years ago, I had a feed yard manager say that I really wish I had marbling EPDs on all these steers that are in this pen. What do you do about EPDs for marbling score on those steers do? What he really wanted was to try to predict the marbling on those steers, right? But the EPDs the, the P is plus, right? So the EPDs is looking at an animal as a potential parent. And so that's the thing to keep in mind. I think everybody knows that. Okay, so I'm preaching to the choir here. EPDs are always reported in the units that the traits are measured in that they represent. Maybe he's done a really good job in recent years of coming up with some new uh, EPDs, especially on the female fertility side of things. So I think it really adds a new dimension. One thing that we see is misunderstood a lot by commercial producers that are buying bulls is I think they understand the EPD concept pretty good, but a lot of them don't understand this accuracy concept. And so the accuracy doesn't get rid of all the potential noise in the estimate, but it just increases your confidence, right? And the only way to get high accuracy is to have a lot of raw project data. And so that's something that we talk to our students about a lot. And I think there's some of these concepts that they may be um, taught wrongly by ag science teachers in high school. Because when they get to my class, sometimes we have to kind of do some, some corrective type stuff. We'll, we'll pass those out a little bit later. So that's what you're thinking very much. So if you've got a question,
question, stop me. Otherwise, we'll just keep going through this. So here's uh, an example of some bulls from a different breed, okay? And this is related to carcass traits. So there's carcass weight and their EPD and their accuracy. And so let's just talk about those. We have to know something about the breed average. Now, you may or may not be concerned about where your cattle or an individual animal stands relative to the breed average, but it's something to evaluate as a benchmark. And the biggest thing that a lot of people that are not familiar with cattle breeding uh, assume wrongly is that if you have a bull that has about uh, EPD plus 40, that, that means it's 40 units above the breed average. And that's not true, right? I mean, it might be true, but chances are most breed associations have had EPDs around so long that there's a base year, and the genetic change that's been made over time has deviated the average genetic value of the animals. Okay? So the real value of EPDs is comparing that number to something else. The EPD alone doesn't tell you anything. It's got to be compared to something. Okay? So here's three bulls, Gridmeister, Little Jim, and Young Gun. Okay, so for carcass weight, if you say, okay, I'm going to breed animals, uh, breed females to Gridmeister and Little Jim, how much difference should I expect in the average performance of those two crossing groups? So on average, how much difference should there be in carcass weight from Gridmeister's calves compared to Little Jim's calves. Anybody want to throw the number? <coughs> What's the, what, what is the expected quantity difference? 50 yeah. pounds, right? That's the real EPD. We have a value on an animal, right? But the real expected quantity difference is the difference in two different animals' genetic values, right? So I can mess that up because I could breed this bull to a different type of cow than this bull. So it's assuming that those two animals have the equal opportunity to express their genes and the performance. But if I bred all this, if I bred this bull to uh, heifers, chances are the carcasses from the progeny of those heifers are going to have a lower weight just because they're out heifers. So if I breed, if I preferentially breed those bulls to different types, then that throws off this difference. Now, the way the breed association does things is that you've got genetic ties across all these different herds, right? We've got the same bull or relatives there up that didn't use the different herds, and so there's a genetic tie across there to make those fair comparisons. But I can mess that up for an individual situation. It's not guaranteed. The thing to think about that is that if I was going to pick between these two bulls, Young Gun and Gridmeister, and I wanted to increase carcass weight, okay, this one's got a little bit of an advantage because we expect his carcass, his progeny's carcasses to be five pounds bigger on average, right? But the main thing is that I've got a lot of confidence in this bull, and that only comes about having a lot of progeny data compared to this is a young bull with no progeny. So the accuracy there is why some people say, I don't believe in EPDs. Because if you think about most of our bulls that are sold are going to go out into herds and they're going to get used as unproven um, parents, right? They're 18, 24 month old bulls and their accuracies are always going to be low. That doesn't mean that the EPD is not any good, but they have potential to change. Our genomic information is a way on which our animals get our accuracies up a little bit and have a little bit more compass. But there's no shortcut to project testing. Now, there's, there will never be a shortcut of not evaluating performance data in animals. So uh, that's being speculated on. Uh, we shouldn't think about that. Okay. The other thing that we'll talk about is that if we want to know where animals rank within the breed, there's always going to be some type of percentile ranking associated with that. And so where that animal stands relative to the breed uh, is always going to be uh, our percentile ranking. So I'll come back to that in just a second.
Sega. So those two goals we mentioned, just think about on the number line, you know, that doesn't tell us what the average level of performance is, that just tells us what the average difference in performance is. And so in one ranch or one feed yard, that 50 pound advantage may be on a really different base compared to another one. Right? But that didn't tell us what to expect in regard to performance. It's just just the difference. Okay? So let me come back to the percentile ranking a little bit. Okay, so this is from a different breed association. Okay, I'll show you all some BB information in just a second. So a lot of times, if we think about the range in EPDs for a particular trait, so this is yearling weight. At this point in time, this was their active sires. There was uh, a little under 5,600 bulls. Okay, the average yearling weight EPD was 47.6. And there was one bull that had a minus 31.7 and it, uh, one that had a positive 131.6, okay? So if we're gonna talk about what level we would like to look at for shooting for the top 20%, 40%, 5%, whatever that is. All that's saying is that if you look at the distribution of all the EPDs, right, that, that tells us the average is, is uh, this value, and then how far mammals are away from the average, tells you what uh, relative percentile they're in. So it's not a difficult concept. But if you're not used to looking at these different categories, you can kind of get overwhelmed with the numbers. And so that's why we always try to talk about the basics and go through some many different scenarios as possible. Okay? So in regard to accuracy, let's talk about that a little bit more. You've seen uh, polls or surveys that say, you know, politician X has this approval rating, and then they'll say margin of error 3%, or plus or minus 4%, or things like that. Okay. That's the same thing as what we would call possible change value a lot of times associated with EPDs. So the higher the accuracy, the more confidence we're going to have in the EPD, because the less chance there is that that EPD is going to flip flop around between different evaluations. So again, we'll talk about drilling weight here. This is related to the EPDs we mentioned a second ago. So let's talk about three bulls in this data set. They all have the same drilling weight EPD of plus 60. Okay, but one has an accuracy value of 0.2 or 20 percent. One is 0.5, and one is 0.8 or 8 percent. So for yearling weight, if that bull's got an accuracy of 20%, then we've got a plus or minus 14.6 on his EPD. Does that mean his EPD is not as good? No. That's the best that's what we've got. And, and some people might say, well, if he's got if we've got his own yearling weight, should we use that for the EPD? Most of the weighting on his EPD probably came from his own yearling weight. But if he's got other relatives, that factors into that too. So if you just look at the trade itself, usually you're looking at less data than if you look at the EPD for that trade, as long as that animal's management went, went into that. Okay? So anyway, they've got the same EPD at plus 60, but if it's got 20% accuracy here, it's going to be plus or minus 14.6. If it's a 50% accuracy, it's going to be plus or minus 9.1. 80% accuracy plus or minus 3.6, right? So that's just some real numbers. You know the concept, but it's, it's surprising sometimes to see how much uh, on low accuracy animals those might move around. <coughs> sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. On average, one time it's going to be better, and one time it's going to be worse. It, you know, it just kind of you know, flip-flops around. Okay, so if we think about the the EPD on these bulls, sometimes we show that and think about a bell curve. Now that's a little bit different concept here. So if we had a bull that had an 80% accuracy, then we're talking about how much variation might be around his EPD. So that's this most narrow, tall bell curve. And one that had a 20% accuracy is this one that's wider and flatter. 
Okay? And most of our students misinterpret this graph to, to say that as a bull goes up in accuracy, that his progeny will get more uniform. Now, does that make any sense from a genetic or biological standpoint? That's not what this is saying. This is saying that as his accuracy goes up, his estimate gets more uniform. <coughs> Right? But if, how much variation there is in his calves is a function of the genes that he has. That doesn't change over time. So that's another thing that we have to do some corrective aspects on. Okay? So if we're thinking about, I got this yesterday off of uh, the BDE page for uh, non parents. And if we think about the genetic trends, so this shows what the average EPD was in the Big Master database relative to animals that were born in uh, 2006 through 2001. We might be interested in looking at how some of these different EPDs change over time. And so the, there's different ways that we could probably describe that. And if you're taking a genetics class, they would call that selection response. If we're talking about breed association, we usually call that genetic trend. It's the same concept. What's happening for that average EPD in those animals over time? And the reason they make that standardized is that they're only looking at animals born at, at one year of time. Okay? And so the gray line here is just those yearly weight numbers across those years. And then the orange line is swing weight. And then the, the blue line is, is for birth weight. And so sometimes those lines look number based on how the scales are done in the graph. So if you just look at these, what would we say might be going on in beef pasture in regard to calf birth weight, mean weight, and human weight for the past 10 years or so? How would y'all describe that? Birth weight Say that again. Okay, so yearling weight's going up, weaning weight's going up. Somebody else over here is saying something is there. Birth going down. Birth, okay. So how does that happen? Selection. Exactly, it's balanced selection, right? If you were not paying any attention to birth weight and you tended to get animals that had heavy yearling weight, you expect birth weight to tag along, right? But the, all the differences that we have in the population means that we can pick animals that have above average yearling weight and below average birth weight, right? And we, a lot of times we might call those curve measures. There's only so far we can go with that. We don't know how that is, right? Can we get a cat that weighs 25 pounds at birth and expects to live probably not, right? But I looked up the birth weight of a little cat that Dr. Perry talked about in anyway, and I was wrong. He wasn't 35 pounds, and he weighed 45 pounds, so he was a lot better than I was thinking. But I'll show you a picture of him uh, later on. So that, that's a little bit of, of, of a fluke, right? There's biological limits to what we can do, but there's a lot of variation in our populations and all of our breeds <coughs> that we can make animals be a lot different for a, for a, for a long time. How, how big do we want to make them is a different question. That's a, that's an economic question. I don't think that's really a biological question. I don't think we want to have 2,000 pound cows in our head. Genetically, I think we could do that, but biologically and economically, that would not make sense. In general, the question. Um, I'm going to speak out of the term in. I've been trying to plant I've been trying to find the perfect animal to take down to Central America, Costa Rica. And I've been trying to find an animal that has all the traits that I want. And with the, with the computer or the um, computerized system in CBU, you can actually find that animal with everything on the positive side. And when you you made them with the cows, okay, you expect something, but what does that take away from what the original idea of breeding beef master and cows, would it go against the principle idea, because we, we shouldn't be breeding for a specific, because then we change the breed, 
it, it's like uh, the principle in, in, the, in the dog shows now. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, dogs used to look different from what they look now because they've been breeding for second and specific things in an animal. So you actually change the characteristic of the animal. That's one of the debates we have out in Central America because our climates differ so much that we don't know if we're, when we use this, we're actually um, hindering the principle of the animal. I mean, at the end, we, we, from so much selection, can we mess up the, the, the animal that we started with? I mean, that's one of the, like, the basic things that, or the controversy is in my head when I'm actually selecting for animals. But I do use it to find everything on the positive side, but I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I, I, since you're, you're a professor, in, is there, in the long term, going to be something bad? So, you've got a lot of stuff there to unpack. So, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, that's good. We're getting to most of that through the presentation, I hope. But, so, let me take about three of those points real quick. So, we do not ever recommend single trait selection because automatically, if you're neglecting other traits, they will come back to haunt you at some point. Okay? The other thing that I have not said that I hope that probably most of you uh, agree with. I'll show you some stuff later on, is that I think the female fertility it ought to be our main focus and then the growth stuff after that. Okay? And, and so if you're thinking about cattle that would fit in a multiple of different types of environments, the best measure of something being adapted or not is probably if she will reproduce regularly. And then after that you can worry about the, the other things. So now from a philosophical standpoint, could you over time have extreme selection where you're producing a very different type of animal. There's no doubt about that. Okay. Now, so is the main, and this is, I don't want to start an argument in here. This be y'all's breed improvement committee discussion, but I, you know, do we want to keep the cattle the same today for the future? Right? I mean, so it, do you think <coughs> that the average beef manager cow today is better or different? Well, worse than the average beef measure cow in 1980, or pick whatever time you want to. Because, so breeds, all breeds are going to change over time as a function of the selection pressures. Now, so but that, that's the philosophical aspect. Can you make animals be so extreme that you compromise some things in performance and overall uh, production efficiency? There's no doubt about that. And so balance is always needed in any kind of selection program. But I would say you really, really can't sacrifice the female reproduction side. So, okay, Dr. Clare's going to say something to correct me. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think the, the biggest thing is, and it goes back to what you said, is this is also, as you look at those genetic trends, they're also in the response to a breed association. What are the goals going to be in the future? And I can remember uh, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, y'all had a, a board meeting down in a river bottom, out in the middle of nowhere, and you know, invited me down there and asked me what my thoughts are. What we're trying to figure out what the future of the beef master uh, animal look like, and, and some of the things that, that were thrown out is you needed to put shot more muscle, but you didn't want to sacrifice fertility in the cow side of it. So I think this trend line is where you think the breeds needs to go uh, from there. But at the same time, as Andy mentioned, you've got to be careful that when you go there, you're not trying to go for something that's already there. So, you know, for example, you know, the Beefmaster female is known for its fertility, hardiness, uh, the adaptability to uh, rough environments. Um, do we want to continue to improve marbling a little bit? Sure, we do. Okay, do we want to make sure we've got enough growth? Sure, we do. But do we want to make Angus out of them, or Simmental, or something like that? And I think that's where, as a breed association, you, you, you know, you got to figure that out. So. Yeah, yeah. That, we could we could spend all afternoon on that that kind of stuff. But uh, but not you know. So the the challenge on any breed association is to be 
inclusive enough that the breeders can agree on the big picture goals, but also be flexible enough that people can do things that fit for their own specific production environments. And I would say the long-term key to sustainability is do you have bull buyers that are coming back? And so that doesn't mean we all do the same thing, right? And, and, and we shouldn't always say, try to produce the same type of cow. They need to fit somewhere and make somebody money together. But we don't all do the same thing. Okay, so I'm going to skip through this. This just shows that, you know, if we were thinking about the concept of EPDs and uh, accuracy, you know, and since it's almost deer season, I thought we'd put a target up here. But if we were thinking about, you know, what is going on when you have an estimate of an animal on its EPDs when you have low accuracy. So if we just took five shots of this target, if in a low accuracy animal, some of the animals can be close to the real true genetic value, which is the bullseye, and some can be way out. They can't be further out than the degree of variation that you have to breed versus one that is high accuracy, right? It's going to change a little bit over time, but it's not going to vary too much around the true, true genetic value. Okay? All right. All right, so let's talk about genomics a little bit, and then we'll uh, look at some pictures. So um, I want everybody to be able to spell EPD, and I want everybody to be able to spell DNA. Okay? So this has evolved tremendously the past uh, 25 years. And so, and I know BDU has gone back and forth with working with uh, some different different programs, and we'll hear a lot from uh, Dr. White in a little bit on some uh, things from Eugene specifically. But <laughs> our genomic information and how that's presented uh, also continues to evolve. And so I don't want to get into the weeds too much on that, but just give you all a little bit of basic things. And this is what I try to get students to think about. So you're, you're probably familiar with this. If you remember back to the biology class, and you talk about the structure of DNA, or may, may have learned that there's four different bases, or nucleotides, or another way to think about that is the genetic alphabet has four letters in it, and the combination of those letters code for different proteins, enzymes, uh, hormones, things like that. Okay. The genome of an animal. The genome is the entire DNA that's in the nucleus, the center of a cell. And so it's pretty amazing to think about, you know, you've got liver cells, skin cells, hair follicles, right, cardiac cells in your heart, skeletal muscle, they all have the same DNA, right, but they have different activities. If you took one of those cells, and you took one nucleus and you physically stretched out the DNA in one of your cells, it would be six feet long. That's hard to believe. It's so thin, packaged so tight, that that much genetic information is in every cell of the body. Okay, so, so the whole sequence is, is about three billion letters. Now, sometimes we have some differences, okay? So here's a sequence of DNA and here's another one. Okay, so those are just all of the different base pairs. And then if we have a single spot where there's a change, so instead of a C, there's a T, then we refer to that as a SNP, if you've ever heard of that. So SNP is just short for SNP. SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, which is a fancy word for change. So there's throughout cattle, people, mice, dogs, throughout all of our mammal species, we have these SNP that are scattered throughout. That may or may not make it useful to look at performance data, but if you have that one SNP, you can think about this. Animals could have two copies of the C, right? Everybody's got a version of the gene that came from mom and dad. The exception is the X and the Y chromosome. And every place else we've got two. So they could have two copies of the C, two copies of the T, or one of each. Now, if there's differences in performance that's associated with those genotypes, then that's a potentially useful genetic marker. And so in different, in our different platforms for genotyping, there may be 30, 40, 50, 60 of those SNPs that each one has a little effect that goes into effect the, the trait. And so we used to talk about, you know, two-star bulls, four-star bulls, and things like that. 
when there were so few stamps that we could talk about the individual alleles here, but in recent years that's gone to presenting values that are more similar to what EPDs look like. Okay? And, and the big utility for that in recent years has been incorporation of genomics into EPDs that, uh, that most of our associations do now. Okay? So I, if, if we have time later on, we might come back to this. I'm afraid we might run out of time. But we did a research project not too long ago where we were shocked to see how much variation there was in calves sired by natural service bulls in our research herd in McGregor. Bulls that had been together their whole life. They were reared there, home-raised bulls. They were together in breeding groups. And within a single year, we might have anywhere from zero to 50 calves sired by per bull. And they're all raised together. How much of that's going on in our commercial herds, I don't know. But anyway, we, that is a big driver of uh, economic values of, of herd sires and, and different bulls. So I've got some slides on that. If we have time, I can show you some of that data later on, but I want to skip around a little bit because I'm afraid we might, might run out of time, and I want to share a lot of time for those questions. Okay, so I've got, got some pictures here, and then I also have a scenario to um, look at. Okay, so you still have those plants? We might pass this around. And so I've got a one-page handout for y'all to look at. So I, we'll, we'll come back to this. Uh, I think I got enough for two in each row. So. Okay. So if you don't get one and want one later on, uh, email us and we can get one to you. Uh, the back of the room, you guys may be out of luck because it's really small back there. But this um, fall, one of the exercises that we did with our students was we had uh, some of the big measure for females there for them to evaluate uh, based on visual aspects, but also gave them some performance data. So we waited until we weighed the calves. And so I want to explain what's up here while y'all look at this, and then we'll come back to it later on. Okay, and so the, the numbers of the cows here, their brands, so their your tag numbers are the second number here. So this looks a lot like a report that you might get from, from BBE, but I took the skeleton of that and altered it a little bit. And I'm not familiar with all of our, our pedigrees and bloodlines yet, so if you ask me about who's and what, I, I probably can't answer that. Uh, Lance probably could. Okay, but anyway, their, their registration numbers are here. So this is out of the BBE database, okay? And so their EPDs are across the top here. But I went in and put what the animal's EPD percentile ranking was associated with that. And so these were the EPDs on these females when they were still non-parents. And that's what the percentile ranking is based on. But this is all their EPDs from a few months ago. Okay. And then I've got a, a column here for cow visual evaluation. And then uh, on her wing calf, the calf's birthday, the calf's ID, whether it was a heifer or bull, and then the actual weaning weight, and then the weaning weight adjusted to, to two or five days. Okay, so there's a lot, of, a lot of data there. I'm going to show you pictures of these cows, and then I'm also going to show you pictures of their calves. So it, our students sometimes feel like they're drinking out of a fire hose because you know it, it's a lot of data, and the ones that are used to looking at EPDs and Things like that really eat this stuff up. The ones that are good at judging they like this because they like the, the live animal side. Of it. And the ones that have zero cow experience, I think, get something out of it too. But it's, we, we kind of have to go through it kind of fast. And so I'm going to read these questions here. And so if we want to talk through this, we can, but we don't have to. But this is what I have the students do. So on the list there, which heifer or heifers are above breed average EPD? For the three traits of uh, birth weight, weaning weight, and urine weight. Okay. Which heifers are the most and least desirable for visual aspects? So that's really limited for us to do today, just based on picture. But that's, that's what we do. 
Okay, which heifers are above breed average for ribeye area UTD? We try to get the students to think about life beyond the weaning of a calf. That maybe how they make all their income one day or consult for that group, but you know, the more we think about overall production be in the way system there. and carcass data, I like to involve that. Okay. So we're thinking about some carcass aspects, and then of those, how do they compare for the calf, calf weight EPDs, birth weight, wing weight, human weight? Which cow do you expect to be the largest for mature size? We'll probably can answer that here. But when they look at it in person, they're looking at frame size aspects. And then it says, if you were to cull two of these young cows, which two would it be and why? Okay? So we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So the pictures of the cows here are the same order that they are on this sheet. Okay? And these are the ones that I'm the most proud of because they're first calf heifers that bred back while they were nursing that first calf. And you know, we're going to keep pressure on fertility, then they have met the first cut for that. So I think of the 18 that we had donated, Jason was talking about this, we lost a couple of those at preg check time in September when we were leaving the calves of the 16 that were still there, 13 were pregnant. Uh, there's two that I have not, that have had opportunity to have a calf that have not. So they probably won't get to stay around. We're going to practice what we, what we preach a little bit. So the ones here, all these cows calved the first time they had a chance, wing the calf, and are bred back to have another calf this, this spring. Okay, so here's the first calf on the list. So her, you're taking on her 7 over 8 on your sheet there. Okay, and this is a function of what I can get done Tuesday morning. Okay, so some of the pictures are not always the best, but that gives you a little perspective on that first cow. Okay, and here's the second one. So she'd be 85, 40 on your sheet there. there I realize I'm not a, the best cow for her, different angles and stuff like that. Okay, don't like the way she's holding them out, but that was the best picture that I had that kind of showed her body capacity in her udders. So that's the 44 over 18. Okay, there's the 988. That's the 18 over 173. That's the 1207. Okay, that one would be something like 851, 8914. And that one is the 7-inch over number. Okay, so that just kind of gives you an idea. So if you are only looking at visual aspects, you're going to get a different perspective in person versus the pictures, right? If you're only looking at visual aspects versus the EPDs, you're going to get a different perspective. And I think we need to consider all those things. So I'll, 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 I'm going to switch five. Okay, so I said all those pictures were taken on Tuesday. Uh, they had had calves weaning on September the 16th and they were all pregnant and bred back, okay? And so, I'm also going to show you pictures on most of their calves. There's two of these cows that I couldn't get a good picture of their calf um, other day, okay? Does anybody want to talk about any of those questions, any? Or go through that, or go on and just show you pictures and keep going? I'm, I'm totally up to y'all. Right, we need to let Dr. White talk at what time are you scheduled to talk there? At 3. At 3? Okay. Okay, so y'all have to be in here for a few moments. But I'm just going to go through the pictures unless somebody wants to have us go through those specific questions. Okay? Alright, so here's the first cow. And I've got the same information here on the picture of her and her cat. Okay, now on the calf, I've just got what the actual weaning weight is. So the ones that they're born the earliest, if you look at their 205 day weaning weight on that sheet, it's adjusted down a little bit, right? Because the actual weaning weight there, that calf's are old. Okay, so these are just the actual weaning weights. Now my perspective on this 
is, you know, we think about the birthday of the cat being the beginning of the story of the animal's life, which it is, right? But that's the first time that we have record of it. The more we learn about some concepts like fetal programming, I don't know if anybody has heard of that, but how we treat cows during pregnancy can have lifetime impacts on the progeny. And we're starting to realize that more in livestock production. We've known about that on the human side of things. For, you know, I mean, that's why we recommend when we don't drink much alcohol or pregnant. There can be permanent lifetime effects on really extreme things. Okay? <clears throat> but that same date is, you know, your perspective on this is a little different, right? The same data mean different things, right? The birth date on the calf is the calving date on that cow, obviously. When she calves the first time is also an indication of her fertility, right? So the birth weight of the calf is important for a lot of things, but it also means a lot of different things too. And so all these cows did what they were supposed to for their first and second breeding season, but they're still not all equal in visual aspects, performance, or, or their, how quickly they bred, uh, bred back and, and how, bred, how quickly they got bred back. First time. Okay? So on these calves, uh, most of these are out of uh, an AI sire and out of the same sire. I don't have that up here on the slide, but we can look that up as well. Okay, so there's her calf. Okay? And here's the second cow. I don't have a picture of her calf, but she calved on March the 9th, and her calf was a little younger compared to others. So we have 458 to weaning. Here's that third cow, calved early, January 25th. Actually, we have her calf 564, which is, all these are good, right, on first calf heifers, but part of the reason that calf's weight is big because it was also older. Okay, here's the fourth cow. Again, pretty early calving. Calf weighed 526, and there's a picture of her, heifer calf. So the reason that we go through this is that in the past, we haven't had our students be able to look at cow-calf pairs. You know, if we think about just selecting heifers to be cows, we've got limited information, even if we have their APDs. Right? And so being able to look at the cow and the calf at the same time is really sometimes eye-opening for these students, and it would also give you a different perspective on making some different decisions. Okay, here's that next cow. So she calved on January the 4th, okay? So her baby that weighed 45 pounds, at weighing weight 582, okay? And there's Cornelius, that was the name of the cow. For that calf, Dr. Clear. Pretty stable calf, right? So, and so his adjusted to a five-day weight's down from that a little bit, but most of these are right around. 500 pounds, okay? So maybe his sheet's not there, but he's got a lot of muscle tendons, other things, okay? So this cow calf kind of in the middle, okay? Her calf was a little bit on the smaller side. And that's this calf right here. That's her favorite calf. So it's also kind of interesting and neat for the students to look at these and say, well, that, I can see that calf's head kind of shaped like that cow's head. And they start to think about making connections on, on that kind of stuff. Okay, so here's that uh, 8851 cow, calf April the 4th, a little bit lighter calf. Okay, and that's her calf. So these pictures were taken also on, on Tuesday. I didn't say that. Same day as the cow pictures. And then. Uh, 8914, early caver, calf queen, 42, and it's a little caver there. There it is. And that last cow, a little bit thinner, a little more framey than some of the others. And she calved in March, a calf weight 430. There it is. Okay? So, I've also got some pictures of uh, some of our embryo transfer calves. Now I've got to stop my PowerPoint and open up that, that folder if you want to see some of those. Okay, so 
lot. I'm going to read the, the matrix here on these. This will mean more for, for some of you. So that's uh, out of uh, Enforcer, and the uh, dollar cow is 66 over 13. Okay, that uh, heifer is out of uh, Riptide, and 540 over 8 was the donor. Okay, that heifer was out of Solution, and the donor was 831 over 8. Okay, the heifer in front there was, uh, says that's the same mating as in the last one. Solution and uh, 831 over 8. Okay. And so this was out of revolution and 30 over 0. So that one, that book has got a different look to it than some of the others. All right. High chief, but and heavy muscle. Okay, that is uh, enforcer and 103 over 685 donor. And I think that's the last one I have with those, just to give you a little bit different perspective. So our natu our our AI and natural service calves and our embryo calves were all born in the same uh, spring calving season. When were those pictures taken? Those pictures were taken on Tuesday. Yes, sir. The same picture, the same day that I took the pictures of the cows. <coughs> one was in the morning, one was in the evening. It was the same day on Tuesday. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, now I wanted to show y'all a little bit of data and get y'all some opinion on, on some things. Unless, does, do, do we want to go through that worksheet? Does anybody want to do that? I wouldn't have to do that necessarily unless we had some specific questions. Okay. One of the things that is surprising to me, I don't know if it'll be surprising or not, but if you look at the birth weights of our baby master calves that we had born this spring, the 45 pound calf was born early, so that's not really that, that calf's destined birth weight, right? But he wasn't going to be a huge calf. But of, of the others, we had calves that were born anywhere from 55 pounds to 120 pounds of birth weight. And so I was surprised that we had that much variability. That just could be a function of the bloodlines there, but maybe there's some other things that are going on with that too. And so, I wanted to go back to some research that we've been doing at a and for a long time and also goes back to one of my first experiences when I was in high school to start thinking about some things because we, at the time, we raised uh, registered red brainness and we made different first generation cattle different ways. So we had some F1s and some three quarter bloods and, and some multi-generation cattle too. And so my dad came and got me one day and said there's a there's a uh, heifer calving, and the cow, the, she's having trouble, the calf's too big, I can't pull the calf, so you can come help me. And so we got out there, and the, you can see the front feet on that calf, and it looked like that it'll be on a two-month-old calf, and they're huge. And so we couldn't do anything with the calf. We took, took it to our veterinarian about 15 miles away. The calf was dead by then, so we had to deliver it by a C-section. And it was a bull calf that weighed 142 pounds. Now, how do you get that, especially out of a heifer, right? So that was really weird, and, and we had seen some differences in, in birth weights. And then when I went to graduate school at AM, realized some of the crossbreeding work that they had done there, starting in the late 1950s and, and continuing on after that, had really documented some of these effects that when we made reciprocal crosses involving Bosinicus and Bosporus that we get some unusual things in regard to birth weight and, and calf development. And so I want to show you a little bit of, of some of that data. And so of course, you know, the breed composition of the beef bench we think is somewhere close to being half Bosinicus and about a fourth Hereford and about a fourth short form based on some genomic analysis done. It says maybe that's not that way for all animals. But anyway, that's the best estimate that we probably have to go on. So some of you have probably seen this before, but if you look at K 
calves that were produced at the McGregor Center. And so these would be uh, non-embryo calves. Okay? I think they're all probably natural service, but I'm not 100% sure. But they're not any of these that are embryo calves. And so the way this is discussed is that if they were out of a Hereford bull and a Hereford cow, so those are purebred Hereford, but it's got the breed of the siren and dam. Okay? And so, and then it's got male and female calves. So the male calves, bull calves are the dark gray bar, and then the heifers are the, are the light gray bar. Okay? And so in the purebred Hereford calves, you know, we saw about a four pound difference in, in, in birth weight between the sexes. Contemporary purebred Brahmin at the stage at the same time had about a three pound difference. And the, the different types of F1 calves that were being produced at the same time the purebreds were is if you cross, if you look at the calves that were sired by Brahmin and out of Hereford, a whole lot bigger birth weight. And a lot of you all are familiar with that concept. But when you have lost in only on the sire side, and not on the other side, we get really big birth weight calves and we get a really exaggerated difference in growth between the males and the females. So those calves may be 15 to 20 pounds heavier, and then the sex difference may also be 15 or, 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 or greater between the bulls and the heifers. Okay? And the opposite of that, when we make that reciprocal cross, when we have boss heifers on the dam side only, and boss parse on the sire side. So that's historical data from 80s and 90s with Hereford and Brahman. More recent data there with A is Angus and N is Nalor. So while we had a purebred Nalor herd, and we're looking at that as our Balsinica's influence, and C, similar effects. And so this kind of phenomenon has been reported all over the world. South America, Southern Africa, Australia, and for years and years we thought it was just an effect of the Boston this cow. But those same kind of effects happen in embryo transfer cases. And so that, that, in addition to looking at cow fertility, is something that we've been working on for, for a long time. And in particular, trying to figure out when you start to interbreed these animals and get beyond the F1 generation, do you see any of these unusual uh, genetic effects still? And so I'm going to show you a slide that's got a lot of different abbreviations on there. But if you think back to making F1 animals, they can be either out of a, you know, uh, a Nalor, a Brahman, or an Angus, or a Herford. And so the F1 bulls that are NA or AN just represents that if they were Angus side or, or Nalor side. And so here's a set of calves that have different F2 and F3. So when we say F2, that's just going to bring the F1 generation, right? And so a lot of people would say it would be kind of surprising to look at all the different color patterns there in those calves. Now, how does that happen? You have more genetic combinations in the F2 generation than you do the F1. Because you can start to get all the great combinations that were there plus, plus new things. And so I like to show that picture because of the color aspects. When we make the F2s, okay, we see some remnants of these differences in, in birth weight. And this was a little bit surprising. So these are all calves that are half Angus and half Galore. But if their sire was sired by an Imbicus bull versus uh, Angus Taurus bull, there was still a big difference in birth weights of the calves. So they're all half and half. And we think that the parents are all at ones and they're half and half, half too. But there's something going on, we think, that maybe some genes of affecting calf growth and gestation and things like that would turn off or on differently if they're inherited through the sire side or the dam side. And so if they were out of a, an Angus sired F1 female or a Nalor sired F1 female, we also saw that same effect, not nearly as much. And so there's something about through the sire side and then also being the Inicus through the sire side that is 
is existing in later generations. And so I don't know if that's related to some of our extreme differences we see in birth weight among some of our composites sometimes. So I, I would like to do some more research where we maybe investigate that with some reassociations and some cooperator herds and, uh, and try to figure that out a little bit more. Because it's just, otherwise it's just sort of undocumented noise in our production system. And it may not be a function of selecting for birth weight all these. Maybe it's just an artifact of how some of the foundation parents um, and some of those matings occur. So if we look at the males versus the females, okay, so depending upon the type of F2, we still see some pretty big differences in the birth weights of the males versus the females, but it's not the same across all those genetic combinations. So that's kind of weird. If you look at the calf weaning weights relative to how those genes of Angus and Melora were inherited through the parent combinations, there was a pretty big difference in average calf weaning weight. So, and then when we look at the, the young cows, and so this is the, the females that are F2s as two, three, and four year olds, then we still see some, some differences that are not consistent for the male versus the female effects for both birth uh, weight and the weight. So, the, the main point of that is that when we have different crosses and potentially different composites that involve cross interest and boss parts to help explain and improve our selection programs. Uh, there, there may be some new uh, types of resources or evaluations that we do in the future that might help make some of those decisions and, and, and better be able to match animals up with their, their work environments. Yes, sir. So You're probably not the only one, so go ahead and answer. All right, so, so, yes. All right, so now with this explanation, is a beef master considered a uh, indicus, a uh, 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 taurist, or indicus? Yeah. I mean, it's a track cross, but so when I, so in Brazil, when they did this, uh, they crossed the beef master with the Lenore, you right. get a higher result, but I don't know if it was a male or a female Lenore, so now I'm kind of confused because we were out there, Brahma is king. So where I'm at, everybody has Brahma. Uh -huh. So we're trying to introduce beef masters. So okay. with this explanation, what's my best bet? Put my uh, female Brahma, uh, I mean female uh, beef master with a male Brahma or a male Brahma. I mean, a male beef master over the, the female Brahma. Because now I'm, I'm yeah. I, I see, I see the difference. If you put a male over uh, Indicus over uh, Taurus, it, it looks like the Taurus, uh, uh, the Indicus is making a, a bigger animal. Well, I don't know. It's also always going to be a function of the milk production potential and things like that too. So when you're making those different types of crosses. The calf birth weight and weaning weight may not be as important to use the cow facility, so we don't have any of that. We're still we're looking at that right now. There's some evidence from uh, some other work with Herford and Brahman that when you incorporate balsamicus on the female, the, the dam lines, that you may have more, more fertility. So like if you if your first cross involved a torus bull on an indicus cow. That that might help you in the long run in fertility compared to that other type of F1. Now, what happens in later generations, we don't know still. So I can't answer all your, your questions right there, but there may, but you may, what I'm saying is that you may see some differences in performance of your cats relative to those different types of crosses. Okay, so, the first way is the main concern, you just need to be aware of it. I mean, some people have been surprised when they were making embryo calves, and so those are the F2s, but you know, some things like this when you, they were making the F1s in particular is you can kill some cows. And we, we, we did a study when I was uh, working on my PhD there, and we had Angus and Herford cows bred to some African breeds and a couple of other things, and we had several bull calves born in the late 
So, and they were on they were on mature cows, but they still have some problems there. But especially on young cows, heifers in particular, that, that's a important concept. Okay, so I think that really goes through most of the stuff that I had in mind, and I was going to hand off to Dr. Clear, but he just left. Uh, what questions have y'all got on the impact? I, I can show you some more. We've got time. I don't know if there's interest or not. But would you like to see the data that we have on our purple differences that we uh, track with DNA? Some of you are nodding. Yeah. Some of you are not at all. No. Some of you are not. Okay, let, let me go back to that, and then I'll be ready to let us have a break.
So the calves in this study were born from 2009 to 2015. We collect birth date and weight uh, within the day of birth. Calves were managed as usual, like y'all do for uh, clostridial diseases, uh, respiratory disease, weaned at seven months of age. Uh, so all that's typical. The, the sire identification is based on DNA, and uh, that's collected at, at weaning time. Okay, and so this just shows the, the bull brand numbers. That doesn't mean anything to y'all, but we use the, the BIF uh, near code system. Some of y'all do that, where the, there's a set letter that corresponds to the year. And so this just shows the year of the birth of those bulls. And as I said before, some were Angus side and some were in the lower side. And that's what this shows. They're all F1 bulls. And so the numbers at the top here mean that it was the 2008 breeding season to produce the 2009 calves, etc. So that's kind of how that's laid out. Okay? And so the numbers here shows what bulls were turned out with the cows and what the age of those bulls were. So you can see most of these were two-year-olds. There was a young bull that was used, and then this one uh, bull that was nine years old. Just because they drop out from one year to the next doesn't mean that there's a problem with the bull, but we have other uh, breeding herds, and so sometimes the bulls may be used with different types of cows depending on the year. If there's a bull that becomes injured or sick, then he's pulled out. But just because this bull is not here and it was later doesn't mean that there's a problem with that bull here. Okay? So this just kind of shows you it would be really neat to look at some age effects, but we can't do that here because we have the same bulls that are used across time. That kind of just shows you the distribution on the, on the bulls in regard to their ages. Okay? Now this slide is the same thing, but this shows the number of calves that were weaned that was attributed to each one of those sires. Okay? So, on that first year, we said those are all two year old bulls except this one, right? That was a one year old yearly bull, so he was like 14, 15 months old, and he didn't sire anything. Okay? Does that mean he's a problem? Well, I mean, he was turned out next year, he was one of the more dominant ones in regard to that. The numbers. And so if you look here among these two year old bulls, so a couple produced three calves at least time. Now some of them have had a calf born and got lost, right? So this is just based on winning makers. But quite a bit of variability there. This older bull had uh, 22. And so for all these years here, and no matter what type of bull we're talking about, you see there's just this extreme variability. And I was surprised to see that among bulls that were all raised together as co I, I wouldn't be surprised if we put bulls in from outside groups and things like that. But I, that would really kind of surprise me. So we're trying to go into this in more detail and try to figure out you know, how much of that is a breeding activity or temperament aspect that could be part of that. How much of that is because do bulls that pass a breeding sound exam hold up better during the breeding season than others. And so we're hoping to maybe midway through the breeding season, bring the bulls back in and do another breeding soundness exam during that time. And also at the end of the breeding season. So there's just a lot of things there to, to go uh, into more depth on. And I think we've got more commercial producers that are starting to think about some of these things too, because there's a lot of these bulls that are not pulling their own weight. Now, do they have to have, to, do some of the bulls have to be high producing because there's some other ones in there that are lower? I don't know the answer to that. There was a story about a professor at a long time ago, and somebody asked the department head, why do you keep Dr. So-and-so around because he's a horrible teacher? And the department head says, he can see why he else look good. <laughs> Maybe some of these bulls look bad because the other ones are good. I don't know. They, when we think about bull groups and things like that, there's a whole bunch of levels there on the dynamics that we really need to understand a little bit more. Yes, sir. That bull 482T, where it shows in 2013 14, he sired 48 calves. 
is it possible that he could just dominate those other bullets away from the herd to, so that he was able to do that? I think so. I mean, how much of that is a personality dominance kind of effect of the bull versus an actual mechanical aspect? We don't know. I think that's absolutely possible. And, you know, we know how our bulls act when we're around, but this is how they act when we're not around usually. And so I don't know how, you know, we, I want to be able to study that without changing their behavior. And that's kind of hard to do, because uh, if we're out there driving around twice a day, writing things down or on a horse, that changes the dynamics of what's going on. So I, I hope we can say that, but I don't want to mess up anything along the way. Did somebody else have their I have one other there? question on that. Okay. Did, is that determined by DNA? Is yes, that how you determine it? It is. Okay. So we've got uh, uh, blood on all the animals, all the bulls, and then the calves, and and reason that we got DNA is this was part of our genomics uh, study that where we tried to find genomic regions associated with different production traits. So that's all based on DNA testing. And we get a blood sample on every calf at birth, but we get the main DNA samples close to weaning time. So that we may have missed some calves before they uh, were weaned because of that. Carrie, did you have yeah, I was just going to say, we've done some research in the engine that's similar to this, where you parent verify the calves back to the sires, um, and sires that are all sort of the same age within kind of contemporaries and things. And um, it's not a very heritable trait, but it's a very repeatable trait. And so if a bull has a lot of calves his first calving season and that data set it looked like he would continue to have a lot of calves his whole life and then vice versa so that looks really similar mm -hmm. to what we were seeing yeah. not every bull fits that profile up here but a lot of them do and so that's uh yeah i mean what the the bull that we the big master bull that we had donated in these centers that dr clear mentioned as a calving bull and he's a he's a nice Oh, he's not huge. Very nice. Perfect in regard to the mature size, I think, very muscular. But when we first got him, people were afraid that he wouldn't want to breed females. I said, well, that's not normal for a bull, right? Um, he was a little slow to get going. Well, he will, one of the grad students, when they saw him go up to the fence and kind of lean on it and push it down and roll over to get into the pasture where there was some heifer. <laughs> Bulls are resourceful, and, and, and so you know the, the dynamics on the personality, social structure is something to me that I think we could probably learn a lot from. Some of that might be related to their actual DNA, but also the more we know about behavior, sometimes it's not just based on the DNA sequence, it's some of that, some other things. And uh, anyway. All right, so just a little bit of a summary about that. So I mentioned before, if you look at the number of calves born per sire in a single year, it ranges from 0 to 51, or the number of calves weaned per bull in a year ranges from 0 to 48. Now, this student looked at the calf prices of the year. We did have individual feeder calf uh, pregnant muscle gradients on, on the calves. We just had their weaning weights. But that was using the market value for what we thought the calves would uh, grade at the sale barn. And so that obviously drives how much income we get per bull. And so if you've got 20 calves, you multiply the calf price and the weight and divide by two to say, okay, well, half that was due to the cow, half was due to the bull. If you start thinking about some of those things, you know, the income per sire in any year from cash sales was zero to almost 31000 per sire. And so I think that's another way to start thinking about some of this stuff is that, you know, you'll hear people say, well, I can't afford to spend more than $3,000 on a bull. Well, there's some bulls that are not worth that, probably, and there's some that are worth a whole lot more than that in commercial settings. And so that's... The more we can do 
with our different types of genetic information and relate that back to actual production, efficiency, economic aspects. I'm, I'm interested in that. And so I think I've probably talked enough with plenty to need a break before our next speaker. But does anybody have any other questions right now before we get started? This may be beyond the scope of what you came planning to talk about, and so we won't do it. But, uh, as you know, in, in recent years, more and more breed associations have gone to formulating indexes, and they are in large part comprised of the utilization of various EPDs in various weights and some other information. My question to you is, if, if you had all the EPDs that you would want in an effort to formulate a meaningful maternal index and whatever other information you would want to use, what EPDs and other information would you use and in what relative weight would you give them? Okay, that's a really important and really good question. Let me spend a couple of time, a couple minutes to time on that. And let me repeat that so everybody can, can hear that. So if we were going to think about the different types of EPDs that might explain maternal performance in regard to the index, what what traits might we include? Is that part of what you're getting at? And yeah. how much and now the weighting on each I, I don't know if I can really address that a whole lot, but for sure, anything related to uh, age at first calving, I think is really critical for that. Um, if a real driver of cow fertility in regard to longevity would probably also be age at when she produces her second calf, because that automatically would include her first calving and then her breed back when she's raising that first calf. And so I don't we I don't know if we have anybody really calculating that, but that to me is a really important concept. And then some other traits that might help explain that could be related to her ability to maintain her body condition. Uh, and so you might can get at some of that with your growth EPDs. But if there was a way to have a mature cow EPD, that would probably be a better indication of that. And so just weight alone may not explain everything, but something that combined frame score and fleshing ability would probably explain a lot of that. So that's really important too. But those other things sort of explain how differences might exist before the cow gets to be later on in life. And, and I think if we could maybe evaluate, uh, if we had a way to better evaluate those younger cows, that that could be really useful. Another thing, this may be a wild thought, but I've tried to get some of our commercial producers to think about this over the years, is that let's say that you've got, uh, I'm just going to use some round numbers here, 100 cow herd. Okay, so we've got 100 cows, and let's say that we're going to need to replace 20% of those cows this next year. So you need to bring in 20 heifers. I think a lot of people would think about, okay, I know something might happen, so I'm going to keep more than 20 heifers, so maybe I'm going to keep 24, 20. And usually we pick those out based on their visual evaluation and their performance records. But in that herd of 100 cows, maybe you've got 45 heifers to choose from. And so if there was, a lot of people can't do this because their carrying capacity and their stocking rates are maxed out on the cow herd. But if you could keep all of your heifers to see who actually got pregnant that first time, and what date they have, if you keep it that long, that would advance you a lot, I think, on cow fertility. And that's not how we normally think about keeping replacement heifers. Does that make sense on what I'm saying? And so 
you know, you would, if, if, if you had the same <coughs> amount of land resources to do that, you would have to devote some of the land for heifers, not having it all be mature cows. And that's a whole different way of operating. I'm not sure everybody would be up for that. That's a really, really important question, what you're asking. I'm glad you asked that. You did mention early calving and calving interval or breedback. Yes, sir. You didn't, I don't think you mentioned the uh, weaning weight, but in, in doing those early calving and breedback, we need to also wean them. Oh, absolutely. I'm assuming that she is doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, so that's another one of those traits is can you have too much weight? <coughs> so, I mean, what's the expectation on a cow if she, if we want to get a 650 pound calf out of her? That may not, that, that, those type of animals that do that may not always be the ones that are the most fertile. And so any trait that we're talking about, Mother Nature usually has some built-in sort of intermediate optimum value. So I think you can get too small on cat weaning weight from economics. I also think you can get too big on pushing on genetics. Especially when you think about it from an overall economic perspective. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the second and third bullet points are very, very similar, so I'll comment on the second bullet point, it's really interesting that that y'all had a bull that that bred 51 cows in that breeding season. So the the second year, and, and I think you mentioned that those bulls tend to if they breed a bunch of cows the first year, they tend to do that year after year after year. So 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 that bull number one that bred those 51 cows. If was he in the same breeding group the second year, there's four or five bulls in that pasture, and is he competing with the same bulls, or is he competing against different bulls every year and still continues to do that? Okay, so there's that bull. So this is the number of weaned calves. So there's he, he weaned 48 calves. Okay, and so that's this bull that we had mentioned a minute ago. Okay. And so these are the bulls that he was with that year, and then the previous year, not exactly the same mix, but several. And so there's three years where he has really high numbers, and so a lot there was a lot of overlap. And it wasn't exactly the same group, but there were a lot of elements that were similar in those groups across those years. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, yeah, that, it's just really interesting. Really, really interesting data that that's possible and that it may, you made a couple of comments about fertility testing bulls midway through and at the end, could it be that on day two something happened to one or two of the other bulls that he tested, he was, he was fertile at his test and then something happened Absolutely. and that bull had the opportunity to breed more cows because the other bulls were shooting blank so to speak. That's right. It, it, all of those are possible and realistic, right? And it's, it goes back to, you know, I've heard the same, a lot of people use it, you know, you, you can't manage what you don't measure. There's a lot of things about bull fertility that we haven't measured. I mean, we haven't looked, maybe we're not asked, we haven't always asked the right questions. We've assumed that once they pass the breeding science exam and we have an adequate winning rate that they're all kind of doing the same thing. And like you, we were really surprised when we saw some of this and maybe it's something we ought to I think it's something we ought to look into. Uh, but there's, there's more questions than answers right now. I want the bulls that will breed 51 cows instead of That's 15. Right. Well, so there's, that brings up a really important point. So there's two different, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to shut up and hand off the, let us have a break before Dr. White talks. But so a bull that can breed and pregnant 50 cows in a 75 day breeding season has a lot of value for a lot of people, right? But it also does not have a lot of depth value in a lot of situations. And it, so y'all know the land ownership perspective is changing in the state, right? And a lot of people don't realize that our average cow herd size has decreased from about 43, 44 cows to about 34 cows. And that's a function of land fragmentation. 
And so there's a lot more smaller herds. So there's two different ways to think about this. I mean, so automatically a bull that is got a lower reproductive potential doesn't automatically have to have lower value in all herds. Because if you've only got 20 cows, you don't need a bull that can impregnate 50. Does that make sense? And so there's, there's maybe some ways to tailor some things here with some different customer bases. You know, who would have thought you could pay people would pay more for a bell of alfalfa because it was more convenient to carry because it only weighed 35 pounds. But that's happening in a lot of feed stores, right? And so that's why I like talking about, you know, let, let's make things work for the right situation. There's a lot of combinations that will work and there's the same answer that work for everyone. Okay. We better stop so we have time for a break. Uh, thank you very much for your time.